It's the uh, 2nd of June 2006 and we're here at the University of Oslo as part of our Parents of the Field project talking with uh, Professor Birgit brock utner uh, about her early experiences in the field of peace studies and peace education. Uh, Professor brock utner thank you very much for uh, giving us the time. I, I know it's a very busy Busy month for you anyway, and we're very grateful for, um, for your sparing the time to, to participate in, in this interview and help us out. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your own background and, and uh, what were some of the things that actually influenced you into being interested in peace research and peace education. Yeah. Well, anyway, I might uh, start with my birth because mm -hmm. I was born right before the war, mm -hmm. 1938, and uh, my mother is German. Mm -hmm. She's still alive, mm -hmm. and uh, she, my, they, my parents met in Germany, uh, and she was active. She was um, uh, also active in the Quakers, um, Quaker movement, mm -hmm. and she was um, very much against the Nazi uh, uh, Nazis. And uh, she, it was good for her that she was able to get out of Germany. Mm -hmm. But then she came to Norway, and being German, it was not easy in Norway. Oh, no. No. Mm. And the occupation came just a couple of years later. Mm. And my father m worked in the resistance movement against the Germans. Mm. And uh, he had to be away a long time. And she then uh, uh, didn't speak Norwegian very well. And um, she told me then, I of course don't remember that, but I was two years old. We went to a, uh, uh, there was a rumor that no, uh, Oslo would be bombed shortly by the mm. Germans. So everybody was uh, evacuated out of Oslo. And my father was then up in north of Norway in the resistance there and uh, she was taken with me uh, out in a barn with lots and lots of people and big lorry and they came out came there and um, the farmer came out and they said well he said you can sleep here in the hay mm. and in the morning we can get milk from the cows but I don't have anything else and then he looked at me and said, and that small child can be in the crib I have. And so mm -hmm. I was la there like a Jesus child with, uh, with mm -hmm. uh, hay uh, above me. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, uh, and then I said to my mother, who, because she always would sing a lullaby for me before her sleeping, I said, sing doch schlaf, Kindchen, schlaf, in German. Mm -hmm. And the people started listening, and, uh, uh, and, then, uh, but she, and she didn't sing. And then I got very upset, so I said it much louder, sing doch mal, sing doch mal, warum singst du nicht? Uh, and uh, then people study what, is, what language is this girl, mm. child speaking? Mm. And uh, my mother said to them, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm German, mm. uh, and uh, I'm, I can't do anything about that. Mm. Uh, and I had thought that I would bring this child up bilingually, and she actually speaks German better than Norwegian now. But from this day, she's not going to hear one German word more mm. anymore. And so she just talked to me in her not well broken, broken Norwegian then. Mm. And um, uh, but I was taught to to love her and especially my grandmother. I was very, very fond of my German mm. grandmother. So after the war, when she came uh, um, to us in '48. I was 10 years old. I picked up German again because she stayed with us for a mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, uh, uh, for me, it was very difficult that in, in the school, people were, all my uh, comrades, they were, uh, and my friends, they were all talking negatively about Germans generally. Mm -hmm. All Germans were bad. And when we started having German as a subject in school, uh, they were told by their parents to get the lowest grade possible. In, really? in German, yeah. yes. Mm. And um, while I always did well in, in German, of course, since mm. I, I knew mm. the language. Yeah. So from a very early age, I learned something about stereotypes and that uh, not all Germans are bad and mm. that there is a, yeah. uh, there is a, um, a difference between uh, a regime and, uh, and the people mm. and uh, that you cannot just generalize like that. Mm. So mm. that really started my, my interest and uh, later on, when I took my, when I got my education, I first was trained as a teacher, uh, in the teacher college. I was in, at Stanford for one year, mm. studying at Stanford, where I was in the Model United Nations. Uh, ah, that, yeah, mm. so that also inspired me a lot, mm. uh, the work there. 
and um, back in, in Norway, then I, uh, I was active in the movement against Norway's entry into the common market. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. So this would be the late Se six, late fifties, early sixties. Yeah, early uh, n n end of uh, of the sixties. Oh, okay. In seventy two, was the first referendum. The referendum. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, there, I was the leader of the movement against Norway's entry into the common mm -hmm. market in the north of Norway, at the, in Tromsø, in the yeah. big city of Tromsø. Uh, at that time, we uh, we were very strong. North of Norway is very very strong. Mm. And um, uh, then uh, I debated all the time against uh, people who wanted us to uh, enter. And especially, I very often went up to Alta, which, uh, which is uh, in Finnmark, in the really very, very north. Yeah. And it's close to the border of, of the Soviet Russia. Yeah. And I saw that one argument that they could not use there was this argument that uh, if we don't join the common market, the Russians will come and get us. Sort of. Mm. Uh, and that was an argument that they used from the yes side, and it went well in, in Oslo. Yeah. But in that area up there, it didn't go. It, it didn't go at all. Mm. How uh, come? Well, uh, that, uh, and that, that became my first research interest mm. in, in the field of peace studies. Mm. Why, how come? Uh, so I uh, made a, a, a stereotype investigation mm. about children's stereotypes of uh, Soviet Russia, and it was Soviet Russia at that mm, time, yes. Soviet Russia, in the north of Norway, in the west, I found an industrial uh, town uh, called Odda, which is demographically very similar to Kirkenes up in the north, but it's, it's uh, has another location, geographical lo location, mm. and an Oslo area. And I looked at the stereotypes they had towards East Germans and West Germans. At mm. that time, Germany was split. Yes. And um, uh, Russia, Soviet Russia, uh, Chinese, uh, Norwegians, and uh, the Americans. Mm -hmm. And, so. and uh, I found that when it came to the Soviet Russians, there was a clearly positive stereotype in the North. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, in the mo most of the children, 60 70 percent, they said, had very positive characteristics of the Soviet Russians. Mm. They say they were very generous. Uh, they always come with gifts. They have these sweet babushka dolls they mm. come with. They drink a lot of vodka and they laugh and they are very happy people. Mm. Uh, while in the, the other places, especially in Oslo, but also in this Oda, uh, there were very negative attitudes. Uh -huh. Very. Mm. Uh, what was the explanation that you came to of this difference? Uh, why was it so different in the north? Uh, because the children there had met Soviet Russians. Ah. Eighty percent of them had actually met them. They had mm. been in their homes. They had, uh, so they knew them. Mm. While the others had not met them at all. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, in the Oslo area, no one in the whole we had about two hundred students there. No one had met a Soviet mm. Russian, yeah. and therefore the so the stereotype Types that they had got from their parents mm. very much, not so much from the school, uh, from the parents mostly, mm. and also from television, radio, and so on. Those stereotypes they could really last there. Mm. They they didn't make uh, well. They got positive stereotypes from their parents in the in the north. Uh, mm. So we also found that the school wasn't that important. Mm. It was more it was the parents, parents the home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm. So that's uh, how it started. Mm. Uh, and uh, then um, uh, I got a job in, in the Ministry of Education for three years. Mm. Uh, and uh, there they had heard about this investigation I'd made. Mm. And that time, uh, Ingrid Eide was the uh, Secretary of State in the Ministry of Education. Mm. She has been, well, had been married to Johan Galtung, you, uh, yeah. and she was also very active in the peace movement. Yes, indeed. Mm. Yeah, and she was asked sometimes to give talks on peace education and so on. She didn't have time, so she asked me to do it. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I started giving some talks and, and uh, using, of course, this stereotype, but then en uh, enlarging it and, and uh, doing more with mm. it. And um, uh, so I was there for three years, and then I got a job here at the University uh, uh -huh. of Oslo, where I continued uh, with uh, working with uh, seminars on peace education. Mm. And then there was a vacancy at the in uh, International Peace Research Institute, PRIO. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, was in 81, 82. Mm -hmm. um, they, it was, the vacancy was longer. It was Sverre Lodgård who was at that time uh, in Cypri, 
in Cypri. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very lot good. And, and I had got his job. Uh, at the at Prio at that time, there were only five uh, permanent positions, mm. and all of them were men. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that. And there were some young women uh, who were very upset about this. Mm -hmm. And they said that now when we have a, a vacancy, uh, uh, we must get a, a woman researcher mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And there were not so many to choose from, mm -hmm. because you had to have uh, qualifications of at least uh, well, a lecturer or uh, the, the researcher you mm -hmm. could. Uh, so, so therefore, uh, I was headhunted for that from, ah. from the Prio men ah. then. Uh, mm -hmm. And they asked me, could I come first for a year? Mm -hmm. And uh, then they wanted me to keep me two more years, but my university here would not give me leave. Ah, so they wanted you back? Yeah, they uh -huh. wanted me back. It was interesting that, that um, at that point of time, there weren't many, weren't any senior women in Prio, because when they started, uh, a lot of the women, a lot of the people around Johan Galton, I think, were women. I mean, Ingrid, for, for, for a start. Yeah. Mary... Uh, Mary Holmboy Yeah, for, yeah. for another one. Uh, yeah, uh, especially those two, yeah. Ingrid Eide and Mary Holmboy Without mm. them, there would probably not have been a Prio. No. And, and that is sometimes forgotten when mm. you have um, jubilees and so on. I mean, mm. that's what is happening very often with women, uh, mm. peace researchers also, is they, they're made invisible after mm. some time. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've been to these uh, jubilees of, uh, of, of Priya also, yeah. where I have been a bit upset about the fact that it's, it's only Johan who is uh, celebrated, oh, yes. uh, 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 while they, uh, they do, did lots of work mm. to, uh, to yeah. make this happen. Yeah, we were talking to Mary, uh, I think the day before yesterday, or perhaps even yesterday, mm. and she was saying it would be very nice to get some of the, some of the early people back uh, into Prio now to talk to the present generation of people in Prio about yeah. what was going on in the early days and, and uh, uh, how Prio developed and, and who was important, you know, because the, yeah. uh, the, the, those stories are being lost, which is you know, partly why we're doing this. So. so you came back to the university and had you been in the, de the Department of Education? Uh, when you first were in this university, or was it? Yes, so, so oh, well, the Institute for Education Institute Research. For education. Yes, okay. uh, I've been here since 1977, mm -hmm. so okay. almost 30 years now. Mm -hmm. But that uh, the year at Prio was mm -hmm. extremely important for me. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I well, I'd also done women's studies, and mm -hmm. I had a course here because I was um, I, the job I got here in 1977 was in a, uh, that uh, our institute had been split into two, mm -hmm. so one part was. Uh, 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 so called social education, uh -huh. where, you, where um, um, Eva Nolan, you might mm. have uh, been interviewing her too, Eva Nolan, uh, mm. Eve, Eva Nolan, she was an important person mm. uh, to also to start up the social education. Mm -hmm. She has also been important in the peace movement. Okay. And uh, she, she, she then started, started it mm. up and um, uh, and I became uh, the first lecturer oh, okay. in in uh, 1977. Okay. And uh, this oh, sorry, this was before or before you were at Priya, or, or when you came back. Uh, no, I was. Uh, I came to. Um, I, I got my job in 77. Okay. And uh, then I got a leave of absence. Uh, from 82. 82. Okay. Yeah, from 81 to 82. Okay. 81 right. to 82. Mm -hmm. And I actually wanted to have it from 81 to 84, but mm -hmm. I had to go back mm -hmm. at 82. So I had just been here four years mm -hmm. okay. before I went. All right, but sorry I interrupted you when you no, were talking no, that's, about that's, how the thing bifurcated. Yeah, because, well, those four years I was here, mm. they were also important because this study we had of social education, mm. it was a study that came out of the student uh, revolution in a way, uh, the student revolution in 68, uh, okay, 70, yeah. mm. uh, that hit this institute very hard. And uh, because it had been very behavioristic, mm. very empirical oriented, very mm. much American research and mm -hmm. very, very little Marx and the very, yeah. uh, so the Marxist students we had, they make the revolution and it was split into two. 
and that part where I got the, was mm. the first one to get a job, uh, and where there were three other uh, professors who came over, mm -hmm. that was uh, run by students in many ways. They decided, and they were the ones also who decided that they wanted me to have a course in women's studies, ah, okay. women in education. So that was yeah. how that started. That's how that started. Okay. Uh, and there was a strong female students here, and they said that we have all this history of history of education, and we don't hear about any women. There were there no women in the history of education. Mm. So I made, I wrote a book together with a, a sociologist uh, called Knowledge Without Power, uh, the uh, history of women in education in mm. Norway. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we wrote in Norwegian, it has been translated into German, but not, not English. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, so I was already known in the feminist movement. And, um, and then I had done these stereotype studies on, peace, on the peace education thing. And I had a seminar Mm. and peace education. But I had not combined those two fields. Mm. They, for me, well, they were two separate fields. Mm. It was women's studies one field, and then peace studies was another mm. field. Mm. And, uh, but then when I came to Prio, the first job I got when I came to Prio uh, was um, that they had got an assignment from UNESCO mm. called the role of women as mothers and members of society in the education of the young Mm. for peace, mutual understanding, and respect for human rights. It's a yeah. bit of a mouthful, but... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's typical uh, a UN mm. title, because uh, then uh, mm. the different, uh, different countries have yes. all got their key yes. Yes. buzzwords you, in. That's right. You must have this in. And so yeah, exactly. It becomes very long. It becomes mm. very long, yes. Mm. So, yeah. uh, so that was the job I got then uh, to, to write this assignment. Mm. Then I started thinking. Um, mothers, I mean, uh, uh, who, who are the mothers? Mm. And uh, in a way, they were, what they probably wanted me to do was to show that women are, uh, it's this peaceful family uh, unit and women are creating peace in the family and mm. so on. But there's a lot of violence going on in oh, lots yeah. of uh, families mm. and there is a battering of women and uh, uh, so, and also boys and girls are educated so differently when it comes mm. to violence. Yeah. And uh, you can just go into a toy shop and, and ask for, uh, you want to get, have a gift for a five-year-old child, and the first question you get is, is it a boy or a girl? Yeah. And if you say a boy, then they go show you a lot of, of war toys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you say it's a girl, you don't see those toys. Mm. So, uh, so uh, that suddenly became a very important mm. part also. Mm. So this is how I started combining the two. The two, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you continued that when you came back from Prio, even even though yeah, uh, and you, the, were, you were brought back rather sooner than you wanted. I, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But I, what happened also when I was at Prio was that I came to the International Peace Research Association meeting oh, in uh, IPRA, mm. IPRA in Canada in 81. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I was there, and since that time I've been there every every time. Ah, so you're going to Cal Calgary? Yeah, uh, this, no, this time this I'm time? not going, because uh, I have you been... You have your conference, of course. Yeah, mm. I have this conference here in mm. Norway that mm. I have to that has so, so much work that mm. I, I just don't get even time to write that mm. paper I should have. But I have been there at every other conference mm. Mm. and uh, been very active member of, been on the board of, uh, of, um, of IPRA and mm. so on, uh, and of PEC, the Peace Education Commission. And what happened there in 81 in Canada was that I came to this place, it's my first time, and there were people like Betty Reardon, for instance, mm. there, Elise Boulding was mm. there. And uh, I knew their names and I knew them, uh, their writing. And yet, and I came into the Peace Education Commission, which is the biggest, uh, and also where, the, where more women, were about half women. Mm. The other commissions, they were dominated by men, about 70%, 80%, something. But this one, Peace Education Commission, there was about half-half, mm. um, and yet no one talked about sexism, mm. no one talked about the fact that boys and girls are educated so differently, and I th thought that, well, I don't want to see say it, I'm rather new here, mm. and there are other people who, uh, who could bring it up, uh, but nobody did, but many felt the same way, mm. so at night we started talking 
and we decided to arrange a meeting to see who would be interested in coming and making a commission on women education, women and peace. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so women military and disarm mil women militarism and disarmament we called it. Mm -hmm. And so we called that meeting, and uh, there were about twenty women who came. And I was made the first chair of that uh, of that group of the mm. Commission of okay. IPRA, uh, and uh, both Betty Reardon and I, we were at that time we were r closely working together and sending each other things mm. we'd written and so on. And I was asked to come to teach, teach a college, Columbia, ah, also uh -huh. to teach there a couple of times in the mm. summer schools, and uh, we both started writing books, and they, they came out the same year, 1985. Mm. Uh, and her, hers was on sexism, militarism, uh, and mine was uh, then educating for peace, a feminist perspective. Mm. So it, it sounds as though that particular time, the sort of early 80s, were, were, was a sort of a breakthrough where people it started was. to take notice of uh, women's ideas and women's approaches perhaps for the first time in the peace movement generally? Yes, yes, yes. I think that was really a breakthrough where you got both feminism mm. and the peace studies to meet. Mm. Before that you had had something like the Women's International League for Peace of Freedom. Mm. Uh, they were working on peace issues. Mm -hmm. They were women, but they were working on peace issues, but they were not really combining mm. the feminist thoughts with it. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so they were, they could, well they would just that they were mm. women working for peace, mm. uh, while we were uh, taking all we had been working with feminism and women's studies, yeah. and we were taking insights from there mm. over to the peace studies. Mm. So we changed uh, peace studies quite a while, bit, and that book that I wrote, Educating for Peace, uh, Feminist Perspective, that came out in four editions in the U.S. Mm. and uh, it was translated first into Korean, and then into Italian, mm. and then into Norwegian. I wrote it in English. <laughs> yes. uh, the others I could understand, but Korean? Why Korean particularly? Was there, was there a strong feminist movement in, in uh, Korea? Or were, were, did, were educators interested in, uh, in the difference between you know, educating um, boys and women? Well, That's a slight puzzle for me. Why, why? Yeah, well, I think there are some coincidences. Mm. I think it partly had to do with the fact that uh, Håkan Liberg, uh, the Swedish uh, yeah. Um, uh, Dan Swedish Danish <laughs> peace researcher. Uh, he was in, in Korea at that uh, oh, uh, peace see. university there, mm -hmm. and uh, he met uh, especially one woman who was very interested in in the peace issues mm -hmm. uh, and, and feminism. Mm. And uh, he gave her my book, and um, and then she said, "Well, I had to translate. This must be come out in, in oh, Korean." Okay. So it was uh, translated there and uh, sold very well. Mm. Uh, so I've been a couple of times to Korea and uh, and talked ah. about the peace uh, issues. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, this certainly had an impact on Ypres. It mm. certainly had an impact on the peace movement. Yes. How did you carry that particular theme forward uh, from that point onwards? I mean, you went to to Korea. Uh, the theme became larger and more important, I think, in Ypres. Yeah. Uh, and then how did it begin to permeate into the uh, peace research field from that point onwards? Yeah, you know, uh, the difficulty we had was that we had created this, uh, mm. uh, this organization. Mm. The first thing, we, in that first meeting, there were two men. Uh, present mm. and the rest were women and these two men they behaved very differently um, the one he he talked uh, about uh, f the fact that men don't cry and that they're not allowed to cry and that one should use a lot of time to to investigate this problem that why don't men cry and wouldn't things have been better if men cried and so on mm. he came back to that all the time and he was sort of taking over for us it was mm. it was a bit annoying the other one he didn't say a word at all and and um, uh, uh, we were discussing, we were saying that we wanted to have in our group also some South African women 
black South mm. African yeah. women. Mm. And it was time of apartheid and how could we get hold of them? Mm. Uh, and uh, this man who didn't say a word, he, at the end of the meeting he came to me and gave me a list of black women uh, names and uh, how to get hold of them and everything. Really? So he was South African? He was he? South African. He was a white South African mm -hmm. who had been so much on the side of the blacks that he had been jailed and he had to get out of South Africa. Uh -huh. he, he was a refugee in, in Sweden. Uh, and I t talked with him afterwards and mm. he said that uh, from his own experience of helping the blacks, uh, he uh, would advise us not to have men in the group to start mm -hmm. with because he was a bit upset about this other man how he had been talking all the time mm. and he said that he had uh, learned through his work there to keep quiet and to uh, just be support and mm. try to do support them as much as he could in in ways that where he would not take over mm -hmm. uh, so we we uh, listened to that advice mm. and to start with with we were just women but mm. then we found that we were not able to uh, get a, we, we had fantastic discussions in our group, but we were not able to get it out into the, uh, mm. the rest of the field. Mm -hmm. So we were ghettoized in a way. Mm. So we decided we can't have it like that. So we we opened up for men, and uh, in Sussex in '86 that was uh, we had a conference in 1986 mm. in, in in Sussex, where it was Brian Eastley came. Mm -hmm. And Brian Eastley, you know, is a physicist, yeah. but he has written books that are that really have to do with with um, feminist issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was so surprised to find a group uh, with the same thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really very interesting. And Jan Urberg came to that mm -hmm. meeting, and he was with uh, in our that group mm -hmm. uh, the whole time. Yeah. And Jan Urberg said it was uh, the only commission where he felt that one was really tackling. The basic issues, oh. the really basic issues. Mm. Uh, the South African gentleman, can, uh, who, can, does he have a name? Can you remember? Yes, but I can't remember ah, okay. anymore. I didn't. I had a, a talk, a walk with him afterwards, mm. but I, did, I haven't um, mm. seen but, him later. Mm. Later, but he was living in Sweden at the time. He was time. living at, in Sweden at the mm -hmm. time. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but mm. but then we uh, uh, we didn't only open up for for men, but mm. we also had uh, sometimes uh, uh, we held our conference before uh, mm. the IPRA conference yeah. mm -hmm. so that we could go into the various commissions mm. uh, so that when we were writing about the uh, peace movement and w women in peace movement mm. we could also uh, some of us go into the main commission that had to do with peace movements mm. and bring our perspectives in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that uh, was mm. very important. Mm. And that happened first at the Sussex meeting in '86, was it? I think. Yeah, that we had. Yeah, mm -hmm. we already in '83 we had a meeting in uh, in Hungary, mm -hmm. um, Georg, mm. uh, and that was a very very dramatic time mm. for me because my my eldest son, who was a peace lover and pacifist, mm. he was killed in a car accident. Oh right before and I was the chair of that of Oof. the commission mm -hmm. a difficult and time for it you. was a terrible time mm. but it made me very close with uh, the other women I, w I went and I had my daughter with me to mm. uh, to that uh, conference in mm. 83 I write about it also in in the preface to that book mm. yeah. that came in 85 mm. Mm. and uh, so we were they were crying with me and uh, and we became very close and there were women from India from uh, uh, Finland, uh, mm. from Hungary, and uh, yeah, mm. and Carol Stevenson from the U.S. was part of it. Oh, and Caroline, yes, yeah, Caroline. From, uh, from Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She was also, and she had a, a, a tragic uh, accident herself with the son. So, so yes. we, we we became mm. very very close, mm. and um, uh, yeah. Um. Who were some of the, the the people who influenced your thinking about? Uh, peace education and uh, women's studies and sort of combining those two. You know, we've mentioned Elise Boulding. Uh, were there other people who sort of uh, had interesting ideas and interesting um, thoughts that you adapted? Uh, yeah, well, there was also Robin Burns from mm -hmm. uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, she was important in, the, in those days mm -hmm. when we had this group. There was uh, Kumar de Sousa from uh, India. Mm -hmm. uh, she also, and Hilka Pietele from Finland. No, I've never, heard, I've never come across her. Uh, you you haven't? No, no. Hilka was uh, important, very important mm -hmm. uh, in peace movement in, in Finland. In the 70s? 
70s? Yeah, no, well, uh, 70s 70, or 80s? Yeah, early 80s. Mm -hmm, yeah. Early 80s. And there was uh, Helena Alaverdi and Helena Kekon also mm -hmm. in Finland. Yeah. You know, uh, the Finnish women for peace, especially, they were very, very uh, um, uh, active. Mm. And uh, uh, so, and they. Uh, Helena Kekon, she also came to a meeting in India mm -hmm. where this uh, that I, I told you about this uh, assignment I got from Prio right. uh, from in 1981 uh, and, and that uh, was to be presented at the con UNESCO conference yeah. in India in New Delhi mm -hmm. and um, uh, there many well UNESCO it's, uh, itself was not very happy with this because they didn't uh, they didn't want me to write about violence against women on the mi micro level so they felt that that was not part of of peace it should not be part of the peace uh, mm -hmm. research so so they um, introduced me as a, a militant feminist and, uh, and warned <laughs> against me but uh, but some of the uh, the indian women they were uh, mm. thought this was very good and i was invited to be an extra week at the women's center for mm. development studies in new delhi mm. and that was also because an indian woman govin kelkar Govin Kelkar, mm -hmm. Govin, she was um, the active uh, in the peace movement uh, in India, mm -hmm. and she was at the Peace Research Institute uh, right before. Um, well, the, I had right before the conference. Very, I didn't even meet her, mm -hmm. but she had got my paper, mm -hmm. and be, and then she w went back to India, and she re read the paper and called me from the airport in mm -hmm. Oslo, mm -hmm. and saying that when you come to Delhi. You have to come an extra week, stay with me, come to the Women's Center mm -hmm. for Development Studies. Okay. And the Women's Center, half of them, were, half of the women, people there were men, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, it was an expiring environment mm -hmm. there. And uh, they were, uh, I got much better feedback there on the paper than I did in the UNESCO conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, Govin came also to IPRA conferences later. Uh -huh. uh, so she was also important. Mm -hmm. But, and she'd spent a year at, at, at Prio? No, not la that long. It was uh, f just a few weeks, few but weeks. she came back mm. again. Ah, and, ah. But then I was not there. Mm. But uh, that was again for a shorter time. Mm. And she has been several times to IPRA, but I haven't seen her the last the last 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so she, she was... Uh, so there were people, there were women from Finland, there were women from yeah. India, there were women, so that brought in the, the sort of developing world. Yes. What about people in that, at that stage from behind what we used to call the Iron Curtain? Did, did people come to IPRA in the 80s from the Soviet Union and the East European yeah. countries? Very few, mm. very, very few um, came. But, uh, you know, the Nordic Women for Peace, had uh, mm. uh, they worked together with the women from the Soviet Russia and had that peace march you probably mm. heard about. Mm. The, that was a, a cooperation, and that's a very interesting thing, mm. actually. Now I'm jumping historically oh. a bit, about, but, but when they, peace, they had the peace march, mm. um, the w men who were uh, the ones running uh, the uh, movement against nuclear arms here, mm. uh, no to nuclear arms is the movement. I was also on the board of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, when uh, their petition came from the Women for Peace uh, to, ha uh, to have them also sponsor it and be behind this march to the, to the Soviet Union, mm. they would not do it. They would not do it. They, uh -huh. they felt that uh, one should not go that far into, uh, into politics. Into politics and, yeah. yeah, but and I feel that uh, thing that women have done, which is different from 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 men when it comes to peace movements, is that they have been trying all the time to reach other people, especially women, on the so-called opposing side, mm -hmm. the yeah. opposite. That has been a characteristic. Uh, I, in, in my book, um, Educating for Peace, I've written about three characteristics for uh, women in peace movements. Mm. And one is that they talk about, uh, do our child, children have a future? Mm. And another one is that they, uh, it's completely nonviolent uh, tactics all yeah. the time. The third is this reaching mm. out yeah. to those in our peace opposing camp. And, 
And mm. when they had the first peace march, the Nordic Women for Peace, they marched to, to Paris, you know, first mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And then there was a lot of, of, of criticism here. And they are saying that everybody said that, well, it's easy to march to Paris when they are the same there in NATO yeah. too and so on. What you don't dare to, what you should do is go to, 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 to Moscow. To Moscow. Mm. That you don't dare to do. That's what mm. you should do. And then they say, okay, we'll do that. Mm. And then they started um, corresponding with women in Moscow and, mm. and, and really made that big peace march. Mm. So that was uh, something uh, that mm. was uh, yeah. done by, mm. by women to reach out. But in IPRA itself, there were hardly, and there were a couple, yeah. very, very few. Um, but the Finnish Women for Peace, uh, there was a, a Helena Kekon, mm. who was the first one to get this UNESCO Peace Education Prize. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, she, um, uh, she, she f f loved my paper mm. that I had, and uh, she got it translated into Finnish. Mm with beautiful drawings. I was not told about this before mm. it was reprinted for the second time. Mm. Then I was invited to Finland and interviewed on television there mm. and so on. And the Finnish Women for Peace, they have invited me many, many times. Mm. They had a very big, strong peace movement there yeah. in Finland. Mm. Did they have any connection with the, any of the university peace centers, do you know? T Tampere, for example, was, uh, I think, becoming very influential in Finland at this time. Mm. Uh, but these were people who were mainly in education, mainly in uh, in peace activism, rather than uh, university peace research. I'm, I'm trying to get some idea of the sort of connections and the exactly. networks. Exactly, exactly. Yes, um, is Helena Kekon was you could call her more an activist. Mm -hmm. uh, she had this uh, peace bureau, and she uh, wasn't was not that connected to the university. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but uh, we had a conference at in Tampere, mm -hmm. and that was organized by the peace researchers there. There mm -hmm. were men, all of them. So the uh, there was not a big uh, connection. I mean, they oh. were not in the universities. Okay. That has been some trouble with, with, the, with the few women who have had tenure jobs mm. either in peace research institutes mm. or in the universities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, the activism that has been going on has been outside of those areas. And yeah. that has also been uh, one of the problems in IPRA. There have been in IPRA, you have both researchers, mm. s uh, scientists, uh, many uh, political scientists, right. Uh, men and you have activists, activists and you have yeah. educationists. Mm. So there is always this, uh, um, well, you could call it, uh, well, it's not a split, but but this, uh, mm. there's a discussion mm. between these yeah. groups, yes. and um, the, uh, and some of the scientists find that we should be more researchers. Mm. Some of the activists find you should be more activists. Yes. There's uh, always that tension in the that, field, isn't exactly. There, that tension is is yeah. certainly there, yeah. and some uh, of especially the PRIO people mm. have dropped out. And they are uh, at the International Studies Association mm -hmm. conferences instead, or the International Political Association conferences. Yes, which are enormous jamborees. And, yeah, uh, yes. exactly. That's where they go. At least the, one of the, the, the successes of the peace research, peace education movement is that even places like the International Studies Association now have, a, have peace, peace research sections in yes. them. Yeah, which, remembering back to the 1970s, was almost unheard of uh, yeah. when I used to go to ISA meetings in yeah. that era. Mm. You know, peace research section is peace research respectable enough? Yeah, exactly. To be, you know? Yeah. So, did you did you actually come across that kind of a reaction in uh, in academic life in in uh, uh, in Scandinavia yes. at all? Certainly, certainly. Mm. And I have been in the fields that both of them, I mean, yeah. both women's studies and peace studies, mm. are not uh, regarded as uh, sort of high status fields. Mm. Uh, is it really academic research? Mm. So, 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 and then combining them, mm. uh, you really got that question. Yeah, so you get it, you get it, get it, to get it doubled, don't yeah, you? Yeah, really? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Mm. Um, so um, we left you uh, as part of the institute here, and you, you say earlier on, I think you stayed. Mm. Uh, and did you manage to introduce uh, some additional courses? You started saying you uh, you you, initi you initiated one course in, in sort of uh, mm -hmm. women in in in, uh, in, in peace. Uh, 
did that sort of take off and was it popular and did it expand? Did you have new courses? How did yes. It, how did it develop here? Yes. And the other thing is, did it actually have an impact on other, other universities? So perhaps two questions. Yeah. How did it develop here and how did it affect other institutions? Uh, it did uh, develop here. I, mm. I, uh, it was a difficult decision for me to choose between going on at Perio or coming back here mm. because I, I was in the middle of writing uh, a doctoral, bigger, mm. it's a sort of postdoctoral Dr. Philos thesis, mm. uh, which uh, came out of, of uh, this Educating for Peace mm. that I've been working on. Uh, and uh, I had to interrupt that when I came back here. Mm. Uh, and at Prio they said that um, Sverdi Lodgoy might not come back, so I, if I stayed another two years I might get a, a tenure position. Yeah. But it was just might and they, they yeah. didn't know, so I, I didn't dare to, to gramble on that because mm. yeah. I had a tenure job here. Yeah. So I, I came back, and uh, but that was, um, and, and you know, my son was killed right yeah. after that. That uh, that he was killed uh, also had a big influence on, on what I wanted to work with uh, professionally. Right. Because I had brought, I felt that he was, in a way, uh, was a result of my upbringing. I'm not quite sure if that was right to say, but, but I felt that he had at least become sort of like an, my ideal of a man. Mm. Uh, it was very gentle and he was uh, a pacifist. And uh, um, so I, I started a, a research project about the f uh, feminist mothers and sons mm. uh, versus traditional mothers and sons, uh -huh. that uh, to see how they were, what ideals the mothers had for the upbringing of their sons mm -hmm. when it came to peace violence, when it comes to, it came to the toys they would give yeah. the boys, when it ca came to what they wanted the boys to uh, really uh, work with and uh, mm. to participate in household keeping and, and the caring and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had long interviews, uh, two hour interviews with, with uh, 20 feminist mothers of mm. sons and 20 traditional mm -hmm. mothers. Uh, the way I defined feminists was that they were uh, career women, all mm. working full-time career, yeah. and had done so all, all the time while the sons were young, mm. also small. The sons were around 12 to 15, yeah. and that they were also um, saying that they were declaring themselves as feminists. So okay. they would, right. uh, and and this was in, in this was, these were Norwegian? Mothers. Norwegian women, yeah. Ah, they okay. were all Norwegian women. Okay. And, and the traditional women, they were uh, mostly housewives or, mm. or part-time working. Uh, so they define themselves mostly as housewives. And then they were, were not very fond of the women's movement. So they were uh, yeah, mm -hmm. not marching and the 8th mm. of March and so on. Uh, so those two d different groups. Uh, and I thought that, that they, I would find big differences between them. Mm. But I didn't. Ah. I found very great similarities. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found that they all wanted their boys uh, not to wor have to war toys. Mm. They wanted their boys to be uh, become caring people mm. and uh, to be um, uh, sharing the household with their wives mm. and uh, uh, and uh, to be um, taking care of smaller uh, siblings mm. and uh, doing half of their work in mm. the house and yeah. so on. Uh, yeah. So the very similar ideals. Mm. I wonder if that had more to do with them being brought up in Norwegian culture <laughs> and what you would have found in other cultures. Right? Did you did you it, follow it, that up at all? Yeah, about? I didn't try it out mm. in other cultures, mm. but but uh, um, it was an interesting result. Very many of the mothers felt that the boys had not developed that way. Ah, uh, okay. they, uh, they, but they, they, those were their ideals, but they had mm. not developed that way. Mm. Uh, the clear difference I found between the two groups was uh, at the meta level, when I asked them why, why they thought that the boys had not developed, mm. their, the explanations were very different. The feminist group, they were saying that it had to do with the environment, it had to do with the, the sports clubs that were so competitive, it had oh, to do with, yeah. the, uh, with the television, it had to do with the fathers of the friends, and it also had to do with the fact that they themselves had not had t enough time for their boys because oh, they had been working so I much. See. So they would blame themselves too. Mm. And uh, then they would blame the, the toys, the, the computer games that, uh, that were mm. violent and yeah. all. Oh, yeah. While the traditional mothers would say that it was in the genes. 
Yeah. Ah, yeah. okay. Boys are boys and girls boys and girls. Boys, and, yeah. and, uh, and Test testosterone. Exactly. You know, that's overcomes how they would. All. Exactly. That's how yeah. they would uh, explain mm. it. And uh, I remember one of these traditional mothers I interviewed. She showed me. She said, "Well, you know, I have." never ever given my son any war toys and never I didn't want them to have that mm. in they, we have none of them in our mm. home and given him dolls and so on but yet he was just two three years old and he found this knekkebrö this uh, you know this uh, knekkebrö it's, it's a Norwegian name for it it's a, a hard bread that comes in a in a shape like this oh it's yes a, okay yeah. yeah we have it the same thing in uh, in, in America yeah I'm trying to remember what we call it now but uh, Vasa. Yeah, exactly. Vasa is Swedish. Yeah, that's, so it's, that's, a, a that's Swedish a type one. Yeah. of bread. We use that quite a bit. And it's hard. Yeah. And it, it, it's the shape, a quadrangle shape. Right, yes. And he, she said, and he would start biting it so that he would bite off here so that he could hold it like a gun. And they would say, bang, bang, bang. Uh, and that must be in the genes, she said. Must be in the genes because we, uh, we have never ever mm. had a war gun. So, so that's so the way they would explain it, that mm. the, they So are. there's a gun making gene. Yeah, yeah. That sounds there is a little <laughs> odd, yeah. there we are. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. What do you do in a society that uses bows and arrows? Do they, yeah. do they bite? Well, never mind, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but it's an interesting explanation. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the study that you were doing here. Yeah. And you were also developing courses here and... Yes. Uh, I had courses in, uh, in peace education, mm -hmm. peace studies, and uh, uh, I was asked by people who were in, active in the peace movement mm -hmm. uh, to give my courses in, as night classes or afternoon classes mm -hmm. so that they could come uh, because several of them were work they were working yeah. in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So I had that for two, three semesters mm -hmm. uh, where, I, where uh, I had those courses. Mm -hmm. What was the students' response to this? Did they come in large numbers? No. Where? No, mm -hmm. not in, in large numbers. No. Uh, so it, it would. Uh, there were few few students. Mm. Um, it has picked up lately. And there are some, some more students now interested in mm. the area, mm -hmm. but um, it was not a great interest. Uh, mm. uh, so um, I. Would had, there have been? Forgive me. Uh, uh, would there have been an opportunity to teach such courses later in their careers in schools or? Yeah. Uh, was there a, a sort of spillover into school so that schools started sort of teaching uh, school kids yes. uh, peace studies in, there, there uh, was. in Norway? Yes, there was. was and, and some of the, uh, the, the, those who came to me um, were teachers in school mm. and they came not to take it for credit or anything mm. just because they were interested in mm. And one of them, uh, Anna Halvorsen, uh, she uh, afterwards went on and she even took a master's here in peace education mm -hmm. and she used a lot of it in school. Mm. So she has been trying to build up also in, in uh, she's a regular teacher, mm. uh, but she is uh, using uh, peace theories also in her classrooms mm -hmm. uh, where she is trying to, so she looks at the classroom as a laboratory mm. in a way to get the different groups to work together. Yeah. And she has been working for a long time in a school where there are so 70, 80 percent of the uh, of the young uh, young children there are non-Norwegians. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, so they come. They all all races, all all mm, colors, and so yeah. on. And uh, there have been problems in the school. It's also low a socioeconomic yeah. area, and so mm. on. Uh, and she has been do doing wonderful things with mm. those classes. Yeah. Uh, so, so there are people like that. Mm. But it doesn't sound as though this has become part of the um, uh, the necessary uh, curriculum in schools. That schools have to do something about peace education. Uh, it has been uh, difficult, but but um, there was at the in the council we had a council for the secondary school mm. at, at one time that is not doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Uh, but uh, around the eighties beginning 80s we had that council mm. and that council uh, introduced uh, it was an elective in the secondary school mm. uh, to um, uh, in uh, peace and disarmament education uh. and I was at the, yeah it started when I was a prio actually I was put really? into that committee mm. that and, early yeah that early it started in, in the 80s yeah mm. in the early 80s and uh, and um, uh, the chairman of it he was uh, headmaster of one of the secondary school mm. 
uh, and there was a lot of writings about it in newspapers mm -hmm. that they felt um, um, they disliked the fact that I was a member because uh, because I was working at Prio and they were saying that Prio uh, was um, making it problematic for Norway to have its um, def uh, 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 defense policy mm. and, um, uh, and so I was interviewed by by newspapers, a uh, newspaper has said to me, uh, asked me, uh, are you a pacifist? Mm. And I said, I don't think that that has anything to do with the fact that we're working with this elective. Uh, and he said, well, I just want, want you to, uh, to answer that question. And I said, well, I would like to, to give you a, an article I've written about the work we're doing, showing you uh, the UN resolutions about disarmament education. Yeah. I had also in 1980, there was a big conference in uh, Paris, mm. UNESCO, um, the World Conference on Disarmament Education. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, the leader of the one big commission there, and the uh, chairing the big commission on media, the media. Mm. Uh, and we had been, and I was also the leader of uh, the Norwegian delegation that had prepared this, uh, this uh, our participation in that World mm. Congress. And in the World Congress also there came out uh, statement uh, about the necessity of introducing peace education and disarmament education mm. in all schools all over. So I was using uh, those excerpts and I was also using something that was in our own curriculum plans from and, and showing that we there is enough here uh, for us to justify to really have this as an mm. as a, a theme in our schools mm. uh, and I wanted him to have that to see that we are doing something that's completely legal it's uh, it's not a subversive activity mm. in no. any way but uh, he didn't want he didn't mm. want any of that information mm. he just wanted my answer to the question are you a pacifist Yes. Uh, yeah. um, it, it sounds from talking to you and also talking to some of the other Norwegian peace researchers that peace research had a difficult time in Norway. I mean, you know, Prio was regarded as, you, know, you used the term subversive, and I don't think they were quite regarded as that, but mm. the whole idea of peace seems to have had a very difficult a very difficult birth in, 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 in Norway in some aspects. Um, mm. did, uh, did you sort of suffer from that kind of um, uh, attitude, oh, you know, these people are either idealistic or they're pacifists or they're mm. secret communists? I mean, did that <laughs> affect yeah. you at all? Yeah, well, uh, I knew about that and mm. I, I took, uh, I still took that research position. Yeah. It was certainly idealist. Yeah. At that time, we had got the same salary. Every, everyone got yeah. the same salary. Uh, and that meant that the, the cleaners, the secretaries, yeah. and uh, the researchers on top yeah. level uh, got the same salary, mm -hmm. yeah. which meant that I, from my position that I had here, I had uh, jumped down quite a bit yeah. in salary yeah. from, from the job mm -hmm. here. So, I mean, you had to be a bit idealistic to yeah, do, to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. And uh, that was not the reason why I went back to the university mm. either, that it's paid mm. more to be yeah. here. Uh, and also we were sharing, uh, we were washing the floors, we were making a coffee on, in turns mm. uh, and with, uh, things like that. Yeah. So that, uh, that was part of it. And when you came into the building uh, at that time, you found these big posters everywhere from peace marches and so mm. on. Yeah. And you know that, both the women's studies and peace studies have come out of movements. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, without the peace movement, you would not have had the peace studies. And mm. it's the same with the women's studies. It came out of the women's movement. Yeah. And that has been a difficulty also. Uh, it has been both a, a force and, a, and a, a important, very important, but it's also been some difficulty in it. The importance, of course, is that, that uh, it wouldn't have existed without without them, yeah. but uh, uh, but they also feel that one should be close to them. One should use a language that the people in the mm. peace movement understand. One yeah. should do research that they think is good, mm. and the same with the women's studies. One should also use a language there for mm. women movement people, yeah. uh, and both of the fields have 
uh, sort of left that. They have become more scholarly, mm. more academic, mm. and now at Prio, uh, I mean, the, the researchers have a t totally different salary mm. than than the yeah. secretaries. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, all back to a more hierarchical yeah. system. Yeah. And less comprehensible, I, I think, the yeah. work that, that they do. Absolutely. Mm. Um, you talked about one of your students, I think, uh, introducing peace, uh, s uh, peace studies into schools and uh, some of the ideas and some of the theories that, that uh, have come out of, the, the, out of peace research. But, uh, you know, as an academic, inevitably, I'm interested in theories and ideas. Uh, so were there any particular ones that affected, that influenced you in your work in the way in which you think about, about peace and peace studies and its relationship to gender? Yeah. I mean, who are, who are influential thinkers for, uh, for Professor Brock Woodner? Uh, well, uh, Elise Boulding very much. Mm. Uh, her book on the underside of history. Mm. And, uh, and Johan Galtung and mm. uh, Håkan Wieberg. Mm -hmm. uh, Håkan Wieberg, uh, they, they were both very influential. And uh, in, um, you know, what happened also after I had, uh, I had published this book, um, yeah. Educating for Peace, Feminist Perspective, which I wrote very much for the peace movement and the women's movement. Mm. And I thought that that's where it will be used. Yeah. I had no idea that what it was used that much in the universities, in mm. the US especially, oh, yes. uh, and by male professors also quite yeah. often. So I was in, uh, invited to Indiana, to the university, Indiana University, mm -hmm. where, where a, P, uh, a male uh, professor of law, uh, Harold Pinsky, Mm. Uh, he used this as yeah. as a main course book mm -hmm. in his courses for several years. He yeah. did, and also in religious studies, there was a, was a professor uh, who used uh, it in. Uh, he had fem a feminist religious studies. Mm. It was called uh, uh, Hart, I think is his name, and uh, Jim Hart, mm. and and he used that book. Mm. So I was invited several times to Indiana. Mm. I was again now in Indiana this uh, spring. Was it uh, last in, spring in Notre Dame. Uh, oh, no, um, Bloomington. Bloomington. Bloomington, okay. Indiana. Ah, Indiana. Yeah. Bloomington, Indiana. Mm. So that's where I, I, I was. And these students, they had all read the book mm. and they knew so much about it. So I could not say the things that were in the book. They knew them. <laughs> uh, so they, well, they, that's unfair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, and they came up with very interesting questions. Mm. So I sometimes I said, well, we'll just have a seminar. You just ask me questions out mm. of the book because you read mm. it. And they would say that, well, you write about a feminist perspective, yeah. but aren't there several feminist perspectives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, also you write very little about schools actually, you write more about what is happening in the family and so on. Yeah. Uh, we would like uh, to know w what more could be done in schools. Mm. So that started the new book that I had out and came out in 89, mm. which is called Feminist Perspectives. On, mm. on peace and peace education. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there I'm really trying to combine the fields of, of feminist studies, looking at the different feminist studies yeah. with peace studies, looking at uh, Galtung's uh, um, structural violence, direct violence, mm. and, uh, and you know, he had four cells, so it's a micro level, macro level, yeah. uh, structural uh, or direct violence yeah. and then uh, indirect violence. Uh, I introduced a new category uh, where I would lo look at the uh, in, uh, indirect violence leading to the shortening of life span mm. and indirect violence that leads to a lesser fulfilled life with yeah. human rights and so on. Mm -hmm. So I would make a chart uh, with uh, then six categories, mm. he had four, um, mm. expanding on, uh, on it and getting in that in, uh, at an individual level what is happening to women all the time. So in that s chart of s mm. the six um, cells there, uh, mm -hmm. I would ask the question all the time, where is women here? Mm -hmm. And that was something new that, uh, um, and where a lot of uh, the research that I um, looked at was research that had come out of, of feminist studies. Mm. I, I want to go sort of back to the time when you, know, you became part of the peace studies field. Mm -hmm. um, you now we talked a little earlier about uh, the fact that it was regarded as sort of not quite respectable, not quite uh, academic, um, not quite uh, unprejudiced or unbiased. Mm. 
Um, so that made it a little difficult. Um, has that actually you know, has that changed now? Is it is it more accepted intellectually and academically? Is it now you know accepted here at the institute as an okay thing to study? Uh, uh, well. I don't think it has been accepted much more. There have been changes, uh, especially at, at uh, in the Prio. Yeah. I mean, they have gone from this broad peace concept, and uh, now they are studying more conflict. This is mm. conflict research instead of peace research, and I think that they have found the peace, uh, the peace concept to unwildly to you to. To, to work mm. with, and um, that is a, is a, pre a pity, mm. I find. I, I like much better to, uh, it's diff more difficult to work with the concept peace, but mm. but uh, I think one should do that. And, and I remember uh, Johan Galtung some years ago, he uh, gave a talk at, the, at Prio some few years ago, and he said that I'm now at I'm now in uh, in the institute that used to be a peace research institute. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Ouch! <laughs> yeah, because uh -huh. he felt it was not anymore. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, and uh, it has moved away from a lot of, of what it stood for. I mean, mm. the, it's a hierarchical structure again, and mm. so on. Yeah. And and uh, well, so let me just interrupt. What did it stand for in those early days? I mean, I've heard people say the same thing as you that it's, it's moved and it's, yeah. it's changed. What 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 it, was it trying to do in in those early days? Do you no, it, it was a uh, it was an active uh, body that mm. it, it was listened to also, but mm. uh, but defined on the left side politically, yeah. of course. But uh, at the same time, the, the peace movement uh, liked to. Uh, to be with the people mm. and the people, the researchers would come to the peace movement mm -hmm. and there was much more of that and it was less um, concerned about getting articles into the more scientific journals uh -huh. and, and things like yeah, that. I see. So, I mean, if you start just writing in for the scientific journals, um, you are among a group and talking to each other. Mm. And uh, that was not what uh, peace research was supposed to be. Uh -huh. It was supposed to, to have this strong link with mm. the peace movement. Uh -huh. and, um, and and the the sort of difference between peace research and conflict research. I mean, because that's something that I found working in Britain was mm. you know very much um, very much a sort of a distinction that people made. You know, you were either in one or you were in the other. Was yeah. that the case in 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 Norway and Scandinavia? That there was this clear distinction between you were either here or you were there. Uh, yeah, well, I think when it comes to to Prio, there has been a movement. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we have two institutes that are um, doing some of the same things. Mm -hmm. We have the Norwegian uh, New Policy, yes, New Nupi, 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 yeah, yeah. Norwegian yeah. Policy Institute. Mm. And when I was at Prio at that time, uh, Prio was uh, defined to be sort of on the left side, while Nupi was on the on right. The right. Okay. Yeah, mm. that you cannot say anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there are researchers at Nupi that are more to the left than researchers at, at, at Prio. Mm -hmm. So that distinction you don't find very much. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But apart from being a political distinction, was there an intellectual distinction between those of those who did conflict research and those who did peace research? I mean, mm, what, 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 yeah. I've never been quite clear about where, what the difference is. I'm not sure what I am, for example. No, no. Uh, I, I think it has been more a movement going mm. from Peace research mm. and and to conflict research and and just uh, and you had we had uh, the bulletin of peace proposals you know right, that yeah. was a very very interesting mm. uh, journal that mm. Marek T was the editor for many many years mm. and um, that was also a journal that pe people in well if they read English mm. uh, in the peace movement uh, enjoyed reading read. because you had mm. articles there that were not in a very high level academic jargon. Mm. Mm. Um, but were in plain plain English. Yeah, plain English. It mm. was English, but it was plain, and it mm. and it uh, you could easily be read. I have several articles there on peace education mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Uh, then that is now um, uh, that doesn't exist anymore. And instead, you have a uh, journal that is on a conflict. Uh, security yeah, dialogue. Yeah, exactly. I security think. dialogue yeah. is exactly yeah. security dialogue, mm. and and for security also uh, uh, denotes something on the on the <laughs> right side, on the political mm. in yeah. a way. Uh, CIPRI, uh, the um, strategic uh, institute uh, uh, mm. in 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 Stockholm, also um, was also regarded to be more 
in a way scientific, mm. but not, but uh, working with uh, numbers, big numbers, and mm. a lot, yeah. of, and and not very much to the help of of uh, peace mm. movement people. Yeah. And uh, this strategic, and when you have an Institute of Strategic Studies in London and so yes, on, they are, yeah. very, they are very much also to the right. Indeed uh, they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, um, the, the choice of words here is quite important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. It denotes uh, changes. Yeah. Yes, Huck and Wieberg was talking the other day to us, uh, and somebody else, I think it might have been Hugh Mile at the University of Kent, had mentioned Hulken's ideas of, you know, the whole field you know, really is divided into sort of three or four tribes and they're different from one another and one tribe is the security tribe and the mm. other tribe is the peace tribe and then there's the conflict tribe. And yeah. sometimes, they're, sometimes they help each other and sometimes they conflict with one another. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting that, that you know, as you say, what has happened has been movement. Yeah, there and, has been a movement. And definitely, yeah. Yeah, but Hawkeye is one of the ones who is uh, firmly planted in the peace. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. he is, even though he, I mean, he's a good researcher, he writes mm. a lot, but he, and he's always at the IPRA conferences. He, mm. and he's one of the ones I would really miss, and I don't mm. go there yeah. at this time. Um, one last question on this theme. Um, going back to when you were at PRIO, um, how did women's studies and, and feminist ideas fit into PRIO at that time? It doesn't seem to have been a very strong theme, even in the early days. No, no, it didn't fit in very well. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but that was the reason why uh, the women who were there, who mm. were young, uh, who were there on, on scholarships working on their master yeah. thesis or mm. their PhD thesis, why they, they made a group there uh, mm. and, and they said that we want now to have uh, that one of these researchers and the, um, mm. and the, and the permanent jobs, uh, when it's a vacancy, we mm. want a woman researcher in there. Okay. So that when I came in, uh, I, w I had that group behind me uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and they had um, expectations for mm. me too. Yeah. Uh, so I could, uh, I could not then just uh, start working on something very different. Uh, uh, I yes. was there very much because of their pressure. Mm -hmm. It was the male researchers who had asked me because they had been looking around. They wouldn't mm. take any, any woman. They, they wanted someone who had uh, standing and already yeah. I, I already had a uh, lectureship here and so on. So, um, uh, so they chose me, but it was because of the pressure from the women. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so when I came in, uh, and I also worked a lot with Ines Vargas from Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, she was there as a researcher, and she was the only woman in Salvador Allende's government in Chile. And she's now one of my best friends. Uh -huh. She's also a neighbor. She was married to a Norwegian politician, uh -huh. so, uh, leader of the Labour mm, Party. So she stayed here rather so than stayed. going back to the Chile of the uh, of, of Mr. Pinochet. No, no. I mean, she could go back. She yeah. was um, the, the the threat saw her life several yeah. times. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had to. She was a refugee when she met her husband, uh -huh. a Norwegian politician. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, so we worked together also, mm. and she was also in Ipra the first years, uh -huh. uh, and uh, so. Uh, the women's group in IPRA uh, was was uh, important also, mm. uh, and when I had uh, written this paper um, the f that that the IPRA had asked me to do, I mean mm. PRIO had asked me to do, yeah. mm. and the and the PRIO group was important. They they, they were there, mm. uh, but uh, a couple of the men who were there, especially Marek Te, mm. uh, who was from Poland, you know, mm. uh, didn't like the paper at all. Really? No, uh -huh. no, no. And Marek Te said uh, he didn't like the fact that I, I wrote that women are often oppressed in the family structure, that uh, marriage might be okay for a man but not for a woman, and things like that. Mm. And he's, no. he said that in my house, no one is oppressed. <laughs> so it's Thinking back to your time at PRIO, it obviously seems to have had a, a major impact on you. But what was PRIO trying to do at that particular point in time and how did your interest in, in sort of women's studies and sort of feminist theory fit into what PRIO was trying to do? Uh, well, I don't know how well I fit it into uh, the general direction mm. they had there. Uh, the reason why they wanted me to come, that had partly to do with pressure from the women's yeah. group, but it also had to do with the fact that uh, they felt that they needed someone in peace education. Okay. Uh, but uh, when I came there, 
I found that peace that they looked at peace education in a different way than I did, mm. uh, because uh, the, the male researchers who were there, uh, they thought that peace education, in a way, was to bring their results from peace research out to the general public. Mm. Uh, so it was, in a way, an information job to do and to yeah. translate, because they themselves had not been very good at translating their research results in a mm. way that the normal people and the peace movement could understand. Yeah. Uh, so they needed someone who could do that translation business, yeah. so that into a language um, that they would understand. That was not the way that we, who are peace educators, look at peace education. Mm -hmm. We look at peace education as a separate field. Mm. So uh, were you able to sort of uh, to convince the people at PRIO that you know, they had it wrong and you were going to do something rather <laughs> different? Uh, yeah, in a way, I, I, I tried to explain that to them, but, but then they started out giving me this assignment yeah. mm -hmm. that was given by, by them. They had got it from UNESCO, mm. and somebody had to do it, and that took quite a bit of my time mm. uh, in the first months, and then it was also explosive because uh, uh, because uh, this was a time when I combined these two fields, yeah. we, and, and we had seminars on that. Uh, so, uh, 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 so in a way, I came in with a new uh, perspective. I developed a new perspective while mm. I was there, yeah. uh, and that had consequences for, uh, for, for the field mm. uh, and also for the women working a uh, bit longer than I did, but mm. but I don't think it's much less left of that now. Well, um, did they continue that uh, line of thinking when you returned to the university? Did they when they, uh, they did they replace you by another woman? No, no, uh. no, they didn't. And Svari Lodgo came back ah, to also. Okay. Uh, so it was they had said to me that he probably wouldn't but he came back he was uh, away another year but mm. then he came back and uh, so it it wasn't uh, that f feminist perspective mm. was not really developed among the um, the leading researchers yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you could still find um, find results from the thinking we had yeah. among uh, theses that were written by uh, women scholars who were there for mm. a shorter period because yeah. they always I mean there are normally a around the 20 people there and, and uh, there's just five, six, ten-year jobs yeah. and all the others are there for a shorter mm. period. And there you could find find it, you could mm. track it and find it in the library. Mm. Well, they must have been sort of disappointed then when the, 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 they got you for a year yeah. and yeah. then you know the, the thing fizzled out a little bit yes. because uh, they didn't look for another leading figure in, the, uh, in, in that particular yeah. in that particular line, peace education, or f from that particular perspective, you know, women's, yeah. women's perspective. No, uh, I w but I was uh, happy to get the opportunity, mm. uh, partly because I uh, wanted to use more time for research and on mm. uh, peace issues mm. uh, uh, that I, that, um, uh, and I thought maybe of going on with the peace education, with the stereotypes, maybe in other country and things like that, but, mm. but I got this assignment. Uh, uh, at once, so uh, therefore it we, took me into the direction and then I saw that there was so much interesting to do around that and that mm. nobody had really combined the fields in this way mm. and that, uh, that, that, well that's the reason why this book came out so many times mm. and, uh, and uh, uh, you never know when, when a book is, uh, hits off and, but it was the right time. Mm. Uh, uh, the British talk about a, a book whose time has come. Yeah, thing. exactly. So that was, yeah, 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 yeah. But it was, sounds as though it was a good job that you carried on this particular line of research yourself here and through Ypres because Prio were not going to push it forward. No, no, they, they, are, they have not pushed mm. that issue at all. One of the things that the you know, peace research has always said it is trying to be a sort of you know, practical and realistic and applied uh, it, to have an effect on, on the real world. To what extent do you think we've actually succeeded in doing that? Has yeah. it fulfilled that dream? No, not, not quite. I think that it has been too, too academic. It mm. has become it's too much um, uh, writing for each other in, mm. in scientific journals, uh, too little um, uh, uh, relationship to to peace peace movement mm. peace movements of course are not that strong either uh, uh, now as mm. they were but um, it has not um, it has not really fulfilled that um, mm. um, and also 
Well, it depends a bit. I mean, uh, the current leadership of Prio, I think, is good. Uh, that uh, um, and uh, he uh, he has been uh, used quite a bit on on television mm. and saying saying good things. But uh, for a long time, it has been rather silent. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, from from the Peace Research Institute. Mm. But the field in general, I mean, let's, let's think about it. Well, let's think about it specifically from, you know, your own focus, which is peace education. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. how well has that done in uh, what it was trying to achieve? Well, I don't think very much. Um, there are enthusiastic people around. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are teachers who try to keep up with as a teacher for peace, mm. and uh, they are trying to to keep this up somehow. But it has not really taken off. And uh, what we were uh, what we were doing, making this elective subject in the, in the secondary school, mm. uh, that uh, happened for some years, but not anymore. It sort mm -hmm. of dwindled away. Uh, so that that is the sad thing about it. Mm. You, you haven't actually in Norway or in Scandinavia generally sort of picked up uh, one of the things that seems to be happening in in North America, so United States and Canada, um, sort of taking um, the ideas of uh, mediation and facilitation into the classroom and into mm. the school. Uh, the buzzword in the states is alternative dispute resolution in schools, uh, yeah. where you have you know, young kids going around with sort of you know, mediator on in, in a badge and you know trying mm -hmm. to deal with playground spats and things yeah. like that, and sometimes more more serious things because of course in the states there are just the kind of problems that you were talking about earlier, which you're student uh, and colleague has been dealing with in sort of schools which have mm. you know, racially very mixed backgrounds. I exactly. mean, there are some really serious conflicts in, in, in American schools in yeah. certain parts of America. So, you know, the idea of mediation has been introduced quite seriously. Anything yeah. like that happening in, in, in Scandinavia? Or yes, so? yes. Uh, that is, uh, it has not been, the, uh, it has not been the um, connected in the same way to the peace education community, mm. uh, but there is, a, especially as a, as a psychologist, uh, Dan Olevius, who so comes from Sweden, mm. I think, originally, but he lives in Bergen. He has developed some theories on, on uh, when it comes to bullying, and, mm. and uh, uh, he has programs that have been used quite a bit in schools mm. because we are having also more problems in schools now mm. than we had some decades ago mm. because of well, all this new, the new immigrants and many of them uh, or their parents don't get jobs mm. so they are uh, they are in all sort of problems mm. um, and we have uh, racial problems we have uh, um, well poverty and in pieces where places yeah. we didn't have uh, so there has been quite a bit of bullying going on mm -hmm. yeah. and there was a, a young uh, boy killed, uh, stabbed to death by some uh, right extremist other boys uh. Yeah, some, some time, a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the people got very, very upset about this and had big marches. Um, and he, he was an uh, adopted uh, boy and um, he had, a, it was a terrible thing happening. Mm. So, uh, uh, and I just read, uh, recently, I think it was even yesterday, I read in the paper that one of the schools now uh, had a new project of, uh, where they are working with, uh, with the children who are bullied and those who are bullying them, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to get those groups together and uh, talking about that. Uh, mm. And there are sort of techniques that they have been using that have been rather successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, they have no, uh, and they may be are very practical people without um, without um, getting it up to the mm. level that uh, that is it in the academia. Mm. So mm. there, so that is uh, is a problem too. I mean, you, if you uh, you have to have both, mm. you cannot only write for for um, other colleagues, mm. but uh, you need to also get some of these practical experiences yeah. systematized, yeah. and uh, and being in in journals also, mm. and they are not. Yeah. Um. Also, I mean, I, I think you have to write for for policymakers so that they yeah. will read. And, and that was, I think, one of the that was one of the original aims of organisations like Prio, but I think also Peace Research generally. And um, uh, again, uh, 
uh, how well or badly do you think we've done in having an impact on at the, at the level of policy? Uh, mm. I mean, mm. either in sort of education or generally in sort of the conduct of you know international relations. Well, I don't we think we don't you talk have... very well to grassroots. Do we no. talk any better to, to uh, uh, policy makers? To policy makers. No, but this is the problem you have uh, generally for uh, when it comes to uh, academic research. Mm. I mean, uh, we are saying that when it comes to education itself, also we're doing a lot of, edu of education research as this institute for educational research. But do the people, the policy makers who, are, who deal with education, listen to us? Uh, mm -hmm. We can come up with <laughs> results, mm -hmm. and they are doing the opposite. It, it's uh, it, it is very difficult. Uh, this mm -hmm. whole uh, field of trying to influence the policymakers. Mm. You sound as though you're a little disappointed. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I am. I don't think they uh, they listen very well to us. Mm. But uh, is that their fault or our fault? <laughs> well, maybe both. Uh, maybe both, but this is a discussion we have a lot. Now I'm wor working mostly with the development issues, mm, yeah. uh, development, uh, uh, and, and uh, there also in the development research is the same. Mm. Uh, and we work, we are looking at uh, uh, the Norwegian development aid, for instance, mm. where is going? It's not going to the really poor, and we're yeah. trying to to tell that to the to the Norda, for instance, yeah. and they're not really listening mm. uh, to it. Um, so, but there might be reasons why they're not. They're tied up by, by the World Bank, by other, um, by alliances that they are in, and yeah. that may be the same also yeah. with the policymakers here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are in different alliances, and uh, they they do not decide purely themselves, and not uh, especially mm. not on out of res uh, research results. Mm, yeah, and so they have they have an various audiences uh, and various people talking to them and uh, ours tends to be rather low volume as far as they're concerned. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I think yeah. that's... Uh, mm. uh, they might ask for our advice, they sometimes do. Mm. They sometimes do, but uh, then they're free to take, take it or it not. All, take yeah. it or leave it. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. If you could look into the future and if you could sort of uh, have an influence on the, what we do next, uh, where would you like to see peace research going? What things would you like it to do and to sort of activities it would like to un you'd like to see it undertake? Yeah. Well, I think one one should uh, do more on on integrating uh, the fem feminist perspectives, okay. and uh, and uh, all the insights that we have from women's studies, for instance, uh, mm. um, and that's what we were trying to do when we went into the commissions, the other male-dominated commissions, mm. to say that uh, well, look here, we we have insights that could be used. Mm. So that's one of the first things that uh, mm -hmm. re really should be should be done, mm. because you're, you're writing just uh, the ghettoized. Uh, mm. uh, that is that is difficult. It's the same thing happening here with the women's studies that they are ghettoized in the uh, in institute uh, mm. of women's studies, and they, it doesn't influence and so the general studies of the university. Uh -huh. uh, so you have to. Um, have a, uh, a strategy of, of um, integration or penetration in, into the main fields. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that is got any tactical uh, ideas about how we should do that? How we should do it? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think people like uh, like like uh, Jan Urberg and and, and mm. Brian Easley and so mm. uh, they are people who who can do it partly because they have read. Women's studies. I mean, mm. you cannot go in there without having read, yeah. read it. And uh, um, we, who are women in the field, uh, we have to uh, to both know peace studies and women's studies, mm -hmm. while the men often you only know women peace studies and they yeah. don't. Uh, so that that is some of the difficulty. You have to to really read mm. both both uh, to be able to to combine. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's um, something I would have liked us to uh, to, to see mm. um, move in that direction. Okay. Anything uh, else? Yeah. No. And then then uh, look more. Well, the peace concept that that is of course the the definition of, of the peace and the, mm. uh, that is part of, of peace research all the time. Mm. And I think that we need to to spend more more time on that. You know, when when the peace concept when it first started, it was. Peace is the absence of war, mm -hmm. and then it has developed 
to uh, Johan came with this structural violence, direct mm -hmm. uh, indirect violence, and so on. But that that is is developing. Although, what does it mean in the th in the this time and age? Mm. Uh, and um, also look at the. Uh, um, empirical research between these cells. Uh, Billy Spaulding has done some mm. of that. She mm. found, for instance, that in, in uh, periods where there's an economic recession, um, women are beaten more. Mm. So, so there you find, a, uh, you find a correlation between the violence on the micro level and, mm. and uh, the stru structural violence on on the macro level yeah. and the direct violence on the micro yeah. level. Yeah. Those, uh, those, that type of research I think is important. Okay. Um, and there has been some research at the, at the PRIO uh, showing that uh, two democracies do not uh, fight each other. Well, that of course you have to look at what, how do you find demo define yes, democracy. Right. What, what exactly do you mean by democracy? Yeah, yeah. exactly, mm. exactly. But uh, Nils Petr Gledic especially talks about that, mm. that, uh, yeah. that uh, there are some findings we have in peace research that could be um, well, disseminated better. Mm. If you'd been sitting here interviewing Professor Brock Gortner, what question would you have asked that I haven't asked that you would you know, dearly like to say something about? When I became, I became the head of, uh, of our study here, mm. there was a man from uh, Tanzania uh, who came here, mm -hmm. Abli Shumi, and uh, we started talking a bit about uh, also peace issues and structural yeah. violence and so on. And mm -hmm. he said that you should look at the type of structural violence that is going on when it comes to developing countries. Yeah. How, um, well, there's also direct violence there, but how, uh, how we are under the conditions that uh, we are so, so much oppressed through the structures that have been built up and so mm. on. And then we, d we had a seminar together and we, um, and we decided that uh, I should try to come to, to Tanzania. Mm. Uh, and uh, my husband, he uh, was working in the foreign ministry mm. and he got the opportunity to become an ambassador in Tanzania. Mm. And I then uh, uh, got my job transferred in um, 1987 to uh, University of Dar es Salaam, oh. where I was what for five nice years. What a transfer. Yeah, mm. that was great for, for, five, for almost five mm. years, four and, four and a half yeah. years, I was at University of Dar es Salaam. Mm. And then uh, there I learned very much about uh, developing countries mm. and the type of structural violence uh, that, that is there, mm. also cultural violence in the fact that they don't, are not allowed to use their own languages. Everybody speaks Kiswahili, but uh, yeah. but uh, the teaching has to go on in English, which is crazy. Mm. So that uh, became my big, big interest. But I, I see this also as peace research. Mm. So in the last um, times I've been in IPRA, I have given uh, I've given papers that have to do with with um, um, with the linguistics rights as human rights, yeah. for instance, and uh, the oppression through through uh, rem uh, 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 the continuation of the use of the ex-colonial languages in, mm -hmm. in Africa. So now I'm giving, a, we're having a big conference here with more than 100 Africans coming, there are two or 300 mm. people coming, called Languages in Education in Africa. And uh, it, we have been able to get the interest of, of our of NORA, the Norwegian Development right, Agency, yeah. to, to sponsor this and our university. So, so that is uh, something that I'm working on, on now and see it very much as, as a peace issue. Yeah.